Um, our new Pawsey medalist for 2012 is Professor Tanya Munro, and I ask Tanya to come to the stage. Tanya is in the unique position of being elected as a fellow of the Academy in the same year as winning an honorific award, so this is her second opportunity to talk to us this week. She's a very productive physicist who has made internationally significant world-first contributions to fiber optic sensing and nonlinear optics. Tanya and her team have discovered new ways of generating, controlling, and manipulating light and as interactions with surfaces and molecules, and they are developing advanced technologies for structuring materials on the nanoscale. This research has led to the development of new forms of optical fibers for applications and solutions in telecommunications, biology, health, food and wine, the monitoring of the environment, and defense. We congratulate you, Tanya, and invite you to, to present your talk on interacting light with matter, new tools for sensing. Thank you very much. Warm thank you, Peter, Suzanne, and the Academy. I'm deeply honored by the rec to receive this medal. You just have to look back at the previous winners of the Pawsey Medal, and they combine people who have enormous um, impact in physics and some who have been really personal to me, including my PhD supervisor, Martin de Sturkey, and a dear friend, last year's winner, Brian Gainsler. So it's a rich and wonderful list, and I'm deeply honoured to join it. I, I feel very lucky to be um, able to have a chance to compliment the talk I gave yesterday, to talk today to you about something very dear to my heart, which is using some of these new photonic platforms to create new tools for measurement. And I'm very conscious that I'm the only thing between you and lunch. But I'm very thankful that um, the previous speakers were so good at keeping to time, and I hope I can follow their lead. What I'm going to do today is share with you some quite recent developments um, within our lab and with our collaborators. They're essentially based around creating new forms of sensors using optical fiber sensor platforms that allow new ways of making measurements in situ, whether that's in the human body or in an aircraft, that allow rapid diagnostics, rapid response, and that can allow us, for some of the first times you could do this, to make measurements in fluids at the nanoliter scale. And that often can have picomolar sensitivity. And the way we do this is to do work on new types of sensor architectures, and I'll describe a couple of these, and using a range of different ways of interacting light with samples, from fluorescence to resonant effects to Raman effects, or combining these together, which is particularly interesting. And this is built on a range of underpinning technologies, which I'll not talk much about now, but which will be obvious as I go through from some of the images I show. So the first, the kickoff point for this talk, and I'd like to say, just like the previous speaker, I have three main things here. What I have is three sensor platforms I'd like to describe briefly to you, rather than three surprises. Although, as I'll show you, um, some of these sensor platforms have caused some quite interesting surprises. And I'm going to kick off with one of the comments I, I made briefly in my talk yesterday. And it's about getting light out of optical fibers or getting light out of materials. We all know that optical fibers are fantastic ways of transmitting information over hundreds of kilometers. But that's keeping the light inside the glass. If we want to get the light out to interact it with matter, we need to do something. And the things that have traditionally been done are tapering materials down into tapers or nanowires. And this works really well. But it limits the interaction length, and it makes them fragile and difficult to deal with out of the lab. Our particular approach to doing this that we've been working on for quite some time now is to use the optical characteristics of a nanowire, but to embed it within an optical fiber to keep its robustness and to keep the long interaction length. And we do a lot of work with these suspended core fibers, which essentially feel like an ordinary optical fiber, but at the heart guide light in this little nanorail. And we have now variants of these suspended core fibers that are exposed to the external environment. 
Whereas in this type of architecture, we need to load the fiber, load those black air regions from the end with our sample. In these types of structures, we can measure what's happening on the outside of the fiber along its length. So I'm gonna talk first briefly about this platform. Here's an image of one of my wonderful students dipping one of the fibers into a cuvette of liquid. We typically use 10 to 20 centimeters of the fiber as the interaction volume, but this correlates to, depending on the fiber, five to 10 nanoliters of sample. The simplest way you can do this is to essentially look for a fluorescent response in the sample, because what happens is as you send the laser light down that nano rail in the core, that light interacts with the sample and any fluorescent response is captured by the fiber very efficiently and travels in both directions along it. Meaning that you can leave it in the sample and look at the light coming back down the fiber to make your measurement. Now, I'd just like to make one sort of philosophical brief point here. This work we've done in many different situations for many different chemicals and biomolecules and I won't go through them all. But it's a great example of something that I'm increasingly coming to believe in, which is that Industry-related research, very applied research. Industry re doesn't come to a researcher asking you to do something if there's an easy solution. <laughs> it's only when the problem's hard. And what I've been finding increasingly is that if you're willing to take on industrial applied research, it often creates opportunities for fundamental discovery. And so, and I think that's not the usual picture people have of science. Usually people think that applied research comes built on strength in fundamental research, and that's true in some fields. In others, taking on applied research gives you a chance to do fundamental research. And the brief example I'll share with you is based on this sensor platform. We, working with DSTO, started work on a fuel sensor. What they wanted was a dipstick that could be put in a fuel tank on an aircraft to measure if the fuel was degrading. And this platform I've just described to you was a nice platform to attempt to do that. The thing they wanted to measure was hydrogen peroxide, which is an early indicator of fuel degradation. We worked towards developing this sensor, and in chatting with some wine researchers, learned that this is one of the things they wish to measure in wine, which has now set off quite an active project, has been funded through the ARC linkage program with three wineries to develop smart bungs for wine barrels. But perhaps most intriguingly, this has now led to some work with embryologists and a medical device company to develop tools for listening to developing embryos. Because I just happened to be chatting and I said, look, it's wonderful, we're developing a sense of a fuel and wine. But it seems a bit silly because our particular architecture works with nanoliter volumes and even though we care about our wine, you could use microliters. Um, and we happened to get into a discussion and I learned that a wonderful embryologist, um, Jeremy Thompson, had developed a theory painstakingly over about a decade that little developing embryos give off little waves, little signals of hydrogen peroxide, but there were no tools available to measure them on the scale of a single embryo. And we now have set up a lab inside the medical school at the University of Adelaide where we can bring these tools alongside the developing embryos and for the first time listen to them. So for me, I think that's a lovely story of how you can take research from applied to fundamental. So pushing on quickly, we can use these fibers to measure outside the fiber by opening them up through these exposed core fibers. And one of my wonderful students, um, who's now gone on to be a super science research fellow, showed for the first time you could do this to make distributed measurements of corrosion in an aircraft. So by essentially looking at the time of flight of pulses of light traveling through an aircraft, coming back, you could uh, very quickly diagnose whether an aircraft is rusting without having to pull it apart. Another example of using this particular approach has recently been demonstrated by Lin Nguyen in my lab, another super science fellow, where he's taken techniques from biology, in particular a molecular beacon technique, and by including this within this platform, we've now successfully demonstrated the detection of specific strands of DNA within the fiber, allowing now the detection of specific DNA within very small volumes skip because I'm a bit short of time. And more recently, um, there's an analogy with the work of Professor Paul Byrne described yesterday where we're working with the Australian Federal Police and DSTO to try and develop new tools for detecting explosives. And we've recently demonstrated a Raman-based platform where we look at the Raman signature of materials put within these fibres. And all of everything I've described to you so far is simply occurring by stuffing your sample you're interested in into the fibre. But that in itself 
only uses it as a vessel for interaction. You can do cleverer things if you then functionalise the internal surfaces of the fibre to give specificity, and there are many ways to do this. This is one example where we made an, a specific aluminium sensor by developing specific fluorophores that could attach to the glass. And these then, again, work on a few nanolitres. The second platform I'd like to very briefly introduce you to you it was a serendipitous accidental discovery by an honours student in the lab that had me running down the corridor a couple of years ago, which has developed into a new platform technology. We were working on a type of resonant label-free sensing for biomolecules. It's well-known technique, surface plasmon resonance. But what we discovered is because of the particular way we were doing it, the surface plasmons weren't just indirectly observable like they usually are through a dip in the transmitted light, but they were directly observable because they glow their hearts out. They can be seen visibly by the naked eye. And what we'd stumbled upon is by using a very rough metallic film, we could get these surface plasmons to re-emit light, and then you can see by eye if the biomolecule you're interested in is binding. We initially used this to do some work with human flu. More recently, we've got some very nice results in developing this as an early warning or an early diagnosis for gastric cancer. This has involved some systematic work on making very good oriented surfaces on these sensors. But what you can see in this example is allopropene, ah, I can't say it, E, see it shows I'm not a biologist, where we're looking at down-regulated, normal-regulated and up-regulated APOE here, and these are exactly the diagnostic ranges used for this biomarker in gastric cancer. So we have a tool that we believe will allow a doctor to be able to do um, doctor surgery based early diagnosis of gastric cancer. So finally, in my last point, I'd just like to show you the third platform, which is a really recent extension of our work on resonant techniques, where what we've done is taken a little sphere, which can be placed at the tip of one of our optical fibers. And this sphere can have something called a whispering gallery mode resonance, which allows you to very efficiently detect when a biomolecule binds to that surface. That's well known, but what we've discovered is by putting this sphere on the tip of the fibre, we can enormously enhance the efficiency with which you can excite that resonance and with which you can collect information about that resonance because of the nanoscale structuring of the light in the fibre. And without going through the graphs in detail, what we get is about a 200 times performance enhancement simply by putting the sphere at the tip of the fibre. Now, this is interesting in itself, but what I think is really lovely about it is it means that we can now start to work with clinicians for the first time to put these sensors in vivo. So we can start to make measurements of interesting biology at the site of the biology without having to extract samples. So just to wrap up, I hope I've shown you just some examples of some of the platforms we have for interacting light and samples at the nanoscale. And I really believe that this will lead to some new rapid screening and point of decision techniques, particularly in health, but also in other areas. And I'd just like to thank my team, my funders, and everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. <laughs> Are there any questions? Well, let me ask you something. I'd like you to say a little bit more about how this, uh, how you get light to warn you of, uh, um, what is it, the aging of an aircraft or something like that. It, it all looks very mysterious to me. Okay, it's a very good question, and the brief answer is, imagine you take this fibre with the exposed side, you embed it within the lap joints in the aircraft, and every now and then, when you have the aircraft come down to, thank you, to land, Pulses of green light are sent through the aircraft and you look at the return signal right. and if at some point you have early stage corrosion, right. the fluorophore you've bound to the surface gives off a fluorescent signal and you can work out where it is from the time of flight the pulse comes back to you at. With so with, a, with an aircraft that's made from composites, you would embed this... Embed uh, the optical fibre the within the structure. Itself. It's right. not so different from work people have done in putting fibre brag gratings in masts of ships to look at strain. Right. It's smart structural monitoring. All right, thank you once again. Thanks a lot, Tanya.